Welcome back, everyone, to episode two of Exploring the Messy Middle, where we learn what one of Google's largest studies of consumer behavior can teach us about boosting sales, conversions, and brand love. I'm Dan Monheit, co-founder and strategy director of Hardout. Ladies and gentlemen, we are hacking the brain with science. Um, just to be clear, we are not <laughs> hacking anyone's brain here. Okay, well, we may or may not be hacking people's brains with science. Potato, potato. Let's just get into it, all right? Uh, joining me from Google Australia and New Zealand are two consumer behavior specialists. Uh, first up, we've got Rachel Powell, head of consumer market research. Hey, guys. Hey, and we've got Kristen Sutter, head of strategy and insights. Hey, guys. All right. Hey, so in episode one, we talked about the messy middle, that muddled path between trigger and purchase and the mountain of research that you guys have done to help untangle it. Yes, it has been honestly a huge global project for Google. Um, and it's uncovered some really interesting results. And last episode, we talked a lot about that role of implicit bias, the dino brain or the right brain that really drives consumer choice. Um, now we want to look at is the new model of consumer decision making based on the findings of the study. So the first thing to note in this new model that we were kind of building is that there is no funnel. What? We're, we're, yeah, I know. Did you shocker. Say no, no funnel. Yeah, no funnel. <laughs> Throw out um, everything. A lot of similar principles, but no funnel. So we start with this concept of exposure. And what that means is it's this always on background, everything you know consciously or unconsciously about a brand. So thinking back to the example I gave last time of booking a hotel, um, the exposure for me is my experiences when I've walked by, noticing the location, um, when I look into the lobby, what, what I take away from that, hearing some good or bad reviews from coworkers, any past experience I've had with that hotel, um, as well as any relevant advertising that the hotel has kind of been pushing out at me. All of that is feeding into my exposure. Yeah, I mean, this just instantly makes sense, right? Because when you describe exposure as this sort of background or canvas that everything else happens around, it, it makes the old way of looking at awareness is this very finite top of funnel stage seem kind of cute and, and a bit out of touch with reality because you're right. Like if I decide I need to buy a new coffee machine and I get it down to two brands of coffee machine that I'm thinking about buying, it's not like I magically stop seeing ads, reading reviews, hearing people talk about other coffee machines. So it's, it's I guess it's just going to happen. Yes, exactly. And so within this background of exposure and using your coffee machine example, at some point a purchase is triggered. You decide, hey, I need a new coffee machine. Then at some point later, a purchase is made and you've actually purchased the coffee machine. And the tricky part that we're finding is that bit in the middle. So if you were to map out what a shopper literally does in this space based purely on the observations, and remember we did thousands of these observations, it could look something like this. Okay, wow. I, you know, so for anybody that is uh, just listening only, what we are looking at here is a very, very messy, scribbly, incomprehensible path between two points, which are trigger and purchase. This is definitely not linear. And even just looking at it, I, I can tell I have been that line. I have, you know, <laughs> we've all had that experience where you think you're just going to go and do something nice and simple, like go and buy a new white t-shirt. And next thing you know, it is three hours later, you have missed lunch, you are cranky, you are hungry, you are tired, you have not bought a t-shirt. And you are also wondering, what is it that the next white t-shirt I buy should add to my life? <laughs> uh, you can definitely get lost down some interesting rabbit holes. Um, but the interesting thing is, it's actually not always really easy to understand or think about what's going to be a big and complicated decision versus something that's going to be quick and simple. You know, as an example, we did a study recently where we looked at laundry detergent. And for one of our consumers, she had more than 80 touch points just what? for laundry detergent. Yeah. Yeah. 80? 80, that, that's that, right. That is who I want doing my laundry. <laughs> But, you know, this, this is a great example that demonstrates and reminds us that we as marketers can't make assumptions or think we know what consumers are going to do. We have to look at their reality. I think there's 80 touch points. While that seems ridiculous to me for laundry detergent, it doesn't take long to realize we probably all have categories of things that we would buy that we would easily clock up 80 touch points for that may seem slightly ridiculous to anybody who is not us. So you're right. Like It is surely not for us to say what is high and what is low involvement. Yeah, you're right. And this new model, whether we're looking at 20 touch points or 80 touch points, it suggests that in between trigger and purchase, our shoppers are doing one of two things. They're either exploring or evaluating. Now, these two tasks can happen either simultaneously or sequentially, but they're two distinct mental processes. The first is exploration. So this is a really expansive mindset. I'm discovering things. I'm getting new information. I'm adding brands to my consideration set. 
versus evaluation, which is a much more reductive exercise. So I'm trying to narrow down my options. The interesting thing is on many occasions, a consumer will have narrowed down her options only to discover something, whether that's a new product or a new piece of information that sends her back into exploration mode. So just yesterday, as a great example, I had almost finished purchasing this amazing dress online when I realized that the white belt in the picture on the dress didn't actually come with the dress. Dun, dun, dun. That is scandalous. <laughs> it was very tragical. <laughs> How <time>. dare they? <laughs> um, but, you know, interestingly, what this did was send me back into exploration mode, this time for that white belt, which in turn opened up a whole bunch of new options for dresses that I hadn't seen. Yeah, I definitely understand that. And you just described where my lunch break went yesterday, Rach. <laughs> Straight into that loop. Yes. Um, and, you know, as marketers, this, this infinite loop and this moving between exploration and evaluation can feel quite complicated because essentially the consumer saying, yay, I'm ready to buy. Oh, no, wait, actually, I'm not ready to buy it. Okay, now I'm ready to buy. Oh, no, wait, still not. Um, and as marketers, we're trying to figure out ways to nudge them out of this loop. We absolutely are. So, Rach, please tell me all of the research that you've done. What does get a shopper out of that exploration evaluation cycle and into actually making a purchase? Uh, so, this is where our seven key behavioral biases kick in. The ones we talked about in episode one that are really grounded in behavioral science research. And they help us understand how a consumer is making decisions and what nudges them out. Now, Park here for a minute. There's a lot of work that goes into branding and pricing. So we're going to consider those separately to this particular piece of work. The biases that we did include that are most closely related to getting people out of that messy middle are being present, scarcity bias, social norms, category heuristics, authority bias, the power of free and the power of now. Interestingly, one thing we talked about with the behavioral architects who are our partners for this research study is that these seven principles should hold true regardless of the macro factors affecting us and what's happening in our day to day. That makes a lot of sense because, you know, on a micro scale, it feels like, oh, you know, we're, we're living through unparalleled times. But, you know, if you take a longer, more macro view of the world, I mean, these biases have taken hundreds of thousands of years to evolve, you know, back to being cavemen and how important being with a group were back then. So in, in that context, six weeks or even six months out of our normal routine is really pretty insignificant in the scheme of things. Uh, Dan, I think the appropriate term these days is cave people, cave not people. cavemen. So. <laughs> Thank you. I stand corrected. <laughs> yeah. um, so looking at those seven uh, biases, the first one that, that we really wanted to start with was brand presence. So the fact that we as humans really trust and like what we know and what we can see. In other words, being there is critical and a first step to being one that's being a brand that's chosen. Um, an example, I went car shopping over the weekend and I know nothing about cars. So a perfect example of something that is typically a high consideration category, pretty low consideration for me. So when I started searching online for things that I knew my husband and I wanted, safety features, a large boot for our future camping trips and his golf clubs, um, the brands that were present when I was researching immediately became part of our consideration set. All right, so quick pause here, right? Because you guys are just adding value right from the get-go. This might seem obvious, but this is important, right? If you want to win a race, if you want to get picked, it is really important to turn up to that race, right? You, you can't get chosen if you are not there in the first place. Yes, and you would be amazed how many people kind of skip that first step. But um, specifically now, this is more important. Um, thinking about big disruptions in our lives and our days and, and in our day to day, um, we see that Aussies are trying new brands that they might otherwise not. We actually just did another piece of research that showed this exact trend was that over half of Aussies are more open and trying new brands right now and at greater rates than ever before. You know, the other thing that we do as people, particularly in times of disruption, is fall back on mental shortcuts and rules of thumb. And that's where our second principle, heuristics, really comes into play. We rely on heuristics to help us make quicker and more efficient decisions. There is so much choice out there. Our lives are busy, they're complicated, and we don't have time to systematically review and analyze everything. So as a great example, I love wine. Who doesn't love wine? Oh, what a surprise. I love wine. <laughs> <laughs> but like most Aussies, I kind of fake what I know about wine. I don't really know that. No, sure. Yes. You? Really? That's, that's <laughs> correct. You know, I do know I dislike additives in wine, but I'm not an expert. So when I get to the bottle shop, I always look for the organic label on the wine. That's my shortcut. It's my rule of thumb to kind of get at what I want, which is a wine with no additives. 
I mean, this really is a perfect example because one thing we know about heuristics is that we are really uh, impacted by them when we are overwhelmed, like lots and lots of choice, when we're in unknown or unfamiliar situations and when we don't have a whole lot of bandwidth to de dedicate to the decision that we're trying to make. So if you think about your average Australian bottle shop, you know, you walk in, you have somewhere between, who knows, two and 12,000 different <laughs> options to make. It makes sense that you would lead into heuristics, your shortcuts, your rules of thumbs to make sure you buy something you like and you can walk out with your head held high. Yeah, absolutely. And not only do we kind of rely on ourselves and our own shortcuts, but the next two principles that we looked at explain the extent to which we're influenced by other people as well. So the first is social norms. Um, that's also known as the herd yep. instinct or the idea that we tend to look to what others doing, are doing as a shortcut for our own decision making, um, otherwise known as safety in numbers. I mean, we can't help but think that a whole bunch of other people doing something must be the right thing to do. You know, I guess we've all had that experience where you decide to go out for dinner, you turn up to a popular restaurant, you are told that it is full and you're going to have to wait 45 minutes to be seated, you know, and while you're waiting outside, you look across the street and you see an empty restaurant that is objectively just as capable, in fact, maybe more capable of exchanging some of their food <laughs> for some of your money. And what do we do? Do we decide to optimize for time and go and eat at the empty restaurant? Of course not. We say, I'm happy to wait out here in the cold for 45 minutes because the hundreds of people in this restaurant cannot all be idiots. They must be onto something great. I want a piece of it. Yes, and something <laughs> is definitely wrong with that other restaurant. <laughs> Could be awesome. Who knows? <laughs> it's, it's actually a great example. And, and interestingly, what happens offline actually happens at hyperspeed online. So the internet has really amplified this effect. Sometimes it's something we're conscious of, so we've taken the time to read consumer reviews, for example, um, but sometimes we react subconsciously. So when we click on an ad that maybe includes a four or five star rating. In our research, we found that the ways brand leverage social proof, so things like ratings, can have a really strong impact on consumer behavior. Yeah, and it's not only that we look to our peers, but uh, we also look to people in positions of authority, which takes us to authority bias. Um, and that describes how we tend to follow the lead of those we perceive to be credible and really knowledgeable experts. So back to my car buying this past weekend, I was definitely swayed when looking at safety ratings from industry publications or experts, much more so than if I'd asked you, <laughs> Rach, or you, Dan, what you thought about well, the Well, maybe, car. but it could also depend on what I was wearing, because yeah. the thing with the authority bias is often just looking like an authority is enough there's been lots and lots of research that has looked at people's willingness to take instructions from people who are either wearing lab coats and carrying clipboards or not and perhaps not surprising what what they found was people were far more likely to be compliant with the lab coat clipboard toting people than the ones dressed in casual clothing yeah that's right see dan it's a good thing i'm wearing my lab <laughs> coat today you're always wearing your lab coat rage <laughs> i'm i'm always wearing my it lab looks, coat. <laughs> it's, it's very fetching on you if i may say <laughs> <laughs> so our final three behavioral principles are actually really well-known marketing and promotional tools. So power of now, scarcity bias, and power of free can all be thought of as emotional hot buttons. So things that get people really excited that can be critical in persuading a consumer to break out of the loop and make her purchase. The power of now describes the fact that humans are wired to live in the present, which explains why it can be difficult to save for the future and easy to put off starting that new fitness regime. Ah, but very easy to purchase something online that will turn up tomorrow. Yes, and actually we explored those kinds of offers in the study, Dan, but we'll get into that a little bit more next episode. Um, another bias, scarcity, is based on the principle that limited resources are often seen as much more desirable. That's true. And the interesting thing there is that, again, it only needs to be the perception of a resource being limited. And we saw an amazing example of this not long ago when we looked at some of the um, hoarding behaviors happening in global supermarkets, where just the idea that perhaps toilet paper or pasta was going to be in short supply, combined with the social norms of seeing lots of other people walking around with shopping trolleys filled to the brim with toilet paper and pasta, uh, was enough to make people decide that they also really needed to stock up. And next thing you know, we have a whole country buying weeks and weeks worth of toilet paper in days and days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that can seem slightly irrational, but, but actually it makes sense because it's an instinctive human behavior. Now that's a fairly dramatic example, but even if you think about more strained everyday type examples, so things like limited time only offers, they've also been seen to be really effective through our research. 
Uh, then we have the power of free. So the idea that something costs nothing can have a disproportionate effect on our decision making. And we saw this really clearly demonstrated in episode one when Kristen changed hotels simply for a free breakfast. Yes, and I have a feeling that this story is going to haunt me for the rest of this series. <laughs> no, it absolutely will. And it should because you didn't even eat the free breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, guys. So we've seen how the new model of the funnel is really a cycle of exploration and evaluation and how the seven principles can nudge a consumer out of the cycle and into purchase. So where do we go from here? So in the next episode, we're going to put these principles to the test in one of Google's largest ever consumer research projects. Did you say one of the largest ever? I did one of the largest ever. (laughs) Awesome. I cannot wait. Yes, it is very exciting. So get pumped. All right. Um, So guys, that is us for episode two. Join us for episode three as we decode the messy middle to help your brands be in the right place at the right time for your customers. We'll be posting it on the Australia and New Zealand Think With Google page, which you can find at thinkwithgoogle.com slash AUNZ. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks guys. Bye.